Good. Well, thank, thanks for that uh, kind introduction, John, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to join you today at the 2022 AICD Australian Governance Summit. And I'd also like to start by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of these lands. And I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander persons who are present here today. I think the theme for this year's summit is perfectly timed. For the first time in two years, in Australia and around the world, it feels as if we're able to look beyond COVID to the next phase of opportunity and innovation. There is no question that the pandemic has seen the acceleration of societal changes which has been occurring since the global financial crisis. In this period, society's expectations of corporations have also changed. Now is a good opportunity to pause and consider what should come next from business. There are increasingly loud calls for corporations to be focused on more than simply making profits. And through the pandemic, we have seen many corporations live up to these expectations. Developing vaccines at record speed and cost, providing safe operating environments for their employees, and establishing robust supply chains in support of the communities in which they operate. Now, some are calling this a revolution of sorts, a move away from the shareholder primacy view of corporates that has shaped organizations for generations to a focus on stakeholder capitalism. The characterization of these expectations as ESG may be new. However, from my perspective, the underlying importance of these forces to corporations is not. I mean, it's sometimes asserted that global capitalism and a focus on stakeholder interests are somehow inconsistent. This is simply not the case. It's long been clear that understanding the expectation of all your stakeholders and your business's impact on them is core to running a successful business. However, what is new is the breadth, diversity, and urgency of the voices. The call for organizations to be more accountable is not coming from one stakeholder, select sector, or group, but rather from all corners. The speed and connectivity of these interests via social media only amplifies the noise and complexity. Where in the past, the expectations of governments, communities, and activists may have stood apart from those of shareholders, now shareholders are some of the loudest voices demanding change. This growth in expectations is without a doubt challenging for directors. And the challenge for boards and management teams is to identify the opportunities in this ever-changing environment in order to create long-term value. The next opportunities, like the theme of this year's summit, exists where boards with foresight and discipline understand the value drivers of their organization and their industry, the expectations of their key stakeholders, and where these intersect. Now, at, at BHP, we work hard to do this, with our actions grounded in our purpose, to bring people and resources together to build a better world. And throughout our history, we have recognized we must work with many stakeholders to make a positive contribution to the environment and society. We have not always got it right. And there are many challenges along the way. However, working with our stakeholders is consistent with our values, a vital part of our risk management strategy, and a foundation of good business, and yes, shareholder value creation. In recent years, we've moved to, moved to codify, enhance, and embed our approach to considering societal implications of our decisions, and we call it social value. Now, social value is the extension of the traditional concept of social license, to focus on creating tangible value at our local operations and communities, but also through to a global perspective and our impact on society as a whole. We also believe this is consistent with the long-term interests of our shareholders, as without the support of communities and other stakeholders, BHP cannot succeed. 
It's this integration of social value considerations across the organization that we believe will deliver outperformance and lead to competitive, sustainable returns over the long term. This is the opportunity in ESG. But this doesn't mean that every societal issue is one that a board must grapple with. To the contrary, the challenge for boards today is to identify the key issues that truly matter to their company, what is critical to their business and their value creation. Now, for BHP, some prominent examples of these include climate, cultural heritage, and diversity and inclusion. And I'd like to expand on each of these a little further. First, to climate change, which is undoubtedly at the center of ESG discussions for many corporations. For BHP, the world's shift towards a decarbonized global economy means demand for commodities that support the transition will increase. Now, this is why BHP is shifting towards future-facing commodities like copper and nickel for electrification and battery production, iron ore and metallurgical coal for steel production, and potash to help feed the world's growing population. In 2020, we undertook scenario analysis which looked at four different potential climate scenarios, including a Paris-aligned 1.5 degree scenario. Now, this analysis demonstrated that the more action the world takes to limit climate change, the more valuable it will be for BHP and its shareholders. And this means that our strategic goals are aligned with our climate goals. But it's not enough to simply produce the commodities the world needs. The world rightly demands that the way we produce these commodities must also align with the world's climate goals. Now, BHP has been taking action on climate change for many years, and we've been a leader in climate disclosure. However, stakeholder expectations regarding climate change are accelerating rapidly. The demands for new information, for new targets, for capital plans have increased considerably over recent years. And there's questions coming from all stakeholders. You know, when will your operations have net zero emissions? How do specific commodities fit into the decarbonized world? How much is this climate transition going to cost BHP? What are the returns from that investment? And how are we working with our partners to decarbonize our supply chain? In 2021, we saw the opportunity to take the next step on climate disclosure and became the first company in Australia to put our climate change strategy to a vote at our AGM. We believe it was important that all of our shareholders had the opportunity to engage with us on climate strategy and actions, and the advisory say on climate vote provided an excellent forum for discussion and feedback on our plan. However, the process was not without its challenges. First, while the science on climate change has long been settled, the solutions are not. Every stakeholder has a different view on what should be done. Now, many saw the plan for what it was, a statement of the climate impact of our business and our plans to align with the Paris Accord. Others saw what they perceived as gaps in their scorecard. Now, for example, we used the Say on Climate as an opportunity to openly and honestly explain the challenges associated with the decarbonization of steel production. The world will require more steel to build the necessary infrastructure to decarbonize the global economy. However, at this stage, there's no clear pathway to net zero emissions by 2050 for global steel sector. This is not due to a lack of ambition, and it won't always be the case, but it is the reality at the moment. Secondly, it, was, it wasn't just about the content of our climate plan, but there was also debate around the structure on the say on climate itself. Some wanted an annual vote, some wanted a vote every three years, some wanted a vote every five years, and others didn't want to vote at all. They saw it as a derogation of the board's responsibility to set strategy. Now, we are comfortable that a say on climate vote every three years strikes the right balance between this engagement, which has been absolutely critical to ensure our plans are robust, and the time required to develop and implement a plan, measure progress, and then create the next set of goals and targets. Now, we anticipated a number of these challenges and issues before we started, but we believe the opportunity outweighed the risks. 
and ultimately our investors provided strong endorsement of our climate plan with 85% support. And what's great is we now have clarity that comes from a plan that has been tested and debated with our shareholders, which we can execute against, and we can be measured in terms of our performance. Now turning to cultural heritage. I think cultural heritage represents a perfect example of the intersection between our business and shareholder value and the expectations of key stakeholders. Now our mining operations often exist on the land of traditional owners who have a deep connection to the natural environment and which is tied to their physical, spiritual, cultural, and economic well-being. We don't own the land where we operate, and consequently, free, prior, and informed consent to operate in these locations is what we seek to achieve, and it's fundamental to our business. And we recognize our responsibility to respect and sustain the cultural landscapes in which we operate and work in partnership to ensure we respect the rights of Indigenous people who are its custodians. So we engage on many levels with traditional owners. As a board, we monitor BHP's cultural heritage management, and we engage with Indigenous and traditional owner groups when we visit sites. And from an operational perspective, management works directly with traditional owners and other Indigenous representative organizations to further strengthen our cultural management practices. And sometimes, as part of this collaboration, our traditional owners have also asked that we use our voice to advocate on issues that are important to them. Now, an example of this was BHP's support of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, where the company publicly acknowledged the significance and importance of the statement in 2019, and also reaffirmed, B, reaffirmed BHP's support for the recognition of Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Australian Constitution. If it's important to our traditional owner partners, then it's important to BHP. To some, cultural heritage is an ESG issue. To us, this is simply core to running our business. Mines operate for decades, and we won't be successful if we don't continue to value the opportunity that is presented in honest, collaborative relationships with our most long-term, proximate partners. Finally, diversity and inclusion and workplace culture. Like many ESG issues, diversity and inclusion in workplace culture reflect deep societal issues. Bullying and harassment and a lack of diversity are not confined to the mining and resources industry, but unfortunately, they are too common within it. In a sense, the issues are obvious. Opportunities for employment should be equal and everyone should be safe at work. But there's more. Our data shows that an inclusive and diverse workforce is safer, it's more engaged, and it's more productive. All critical criteria for running a mine site and for the creation of shareholder value. Now, we recognize this, and in 2016, set an aspirational target of gender balance across our company by 2025. And since we set our goal, we've increased female representation across the business by more than two-thirds it now stands at over 30%. In the mining sector, there's another opportunity. A safe and inclusive workforce underpins our ability to attract the best employees and to retain them over the long term, opening up a broader pool of candidates for our business, which is vital in the war for talent. However, gender diversity is only part of the picture. Only with a workplace culture that is inclusive and free of any form of harassment will we truly meet our potential. We know unacceptable behavior still occurs in all workplaces, including BHP, and it shouldn't. We've been focused on addressing all forms of harassment, including sexual harassment, racial discrimination, and bullying for some times, on many levels, but we have more work to do. Now, our progress on gender diversity gives us hope and shows us what can be achieved. And the challenge for directors is to work with management to ensure ambition is matched by real progress. Now, what I hope I've illustrated through these examples in climate change, cultural heritage, and diversity and inclusion 
is that ESG is not about insignificant activities on the sideline of your business or about simply reacting to the loudest voices. These issues lie at the core of business and the enduring creation of shareholder value. Now, each business will have different areas of focus. However, as I reflect, there are some overarching aspects that are applicable to all directors navigating the rise of ESG. The reality of these ESG issues is they reflect the intersection of challenging societal issues with business. And it isn't just business that's struggling for the answers. As I said at the outset, the number of competing voices and opinions is striking. And directors must be able to identify the issues that are core to their business. They must be able to consult and engage fully and synthesize the competing views and interests. And they must work together with their management teams to fully unlock the opportunities. Now, if I can just circle back to the beginning of my presentation, there is no doubt our world has changed, and it comes with a level of complexity that we haven't seen before. Not only are we seeing a shifting geopolitical landscape, digital disruption, cybersecurity, and the direct challenges of the pandemic recovery, but the calls for organizations to contribute to broad social issues. And demands from a range of stakeholders seem louder and more conflicting than ever. In responding to these pressures, it's important to grasp the opportunity within ESG. Companies that look into the future and see the potential of the new world will be rewarded with greater resilience into the future and deliver long-term shareholder value. Thank you. Ken, that was great. Thank you very much for kicking off our first speech there. Um, do have a seat. Now, when uh, I was looking at your speech, which I had a brief chance to have an early copy, yeah. I uh, wrote about it this morning, and I said, here we have the chair of the biggest company in Australia doing the main address at the AICD, and he's devoting his entire speech to ESG. And in classic Canadian, respectful, polite directness, you said to me just now, I completely missed the point. Well, I, I actually, I didn't think I said I, exactly that, Tiki, but it was words <laughs> to those effects. Um, I said, I said I, you know, uh, respectfully, I think you've missed the point, but um, close enough. <laughs> And then as I further reflect, I thought, well, actually, I need to take responsibility for that because clearly the speech didn't, didn't hit the right notes for you. But I think, look, there's no doubt. This is a governance summit, for, first of all. It's not an economic summit. So, of course, we're talking about governance. So I think that, that's relevant for the speech. But there's no doubt when I talk to my peers, um, and, and I'm sure it's the same with the directors here who are in the, in the audience, the rise of ESG is a real challenge. Mm. Um, there's a breadth of issues. Um, it's moving very quickly. Um, there's lots of stakeholders involved. I think the biggest change from my perspective, you know, I've been a, I was a CEO for 10 years, I've been a chair now for six. You know, when I, when I started as a, as a CEO uh, back in 2005, I didn't even know what ES, we didn't have the acronym ESG yeah. yet. And, and when we sat at the, you know, had investor meetings and we sat around the table, we didn't talk about those issues. And then sort of five years later, there was this, individual who would show up called the ESG manager, but they weren't allowed to sit at the big table. They had to sit at the back. They couldn't ask any questions. They were taking notes. Well, today, you know, they're, they're sitting at the table with the fund manager who's making the actual decision. And so that's a big change in, but, in but, corporate life is, the, is, is that shareholders are now, now have a very loud voice. And so yeah. The challenge for, and, and, and really the, the, the point of my, my speech, and hopefully it came across, was in this plethora of issues and complexity, how does a board and a management team sort through all of that? And my advice to, to boards and management teams is look for the greatest intersection with your business. Because then it's not just an ESG issue, it's a business issue that you need right, to Right, so address. you're saying really that ESG should be absolutely core. I mean, that's, that's the, the real, it should be your business. Where it intersects with your business, it's definitely core. You know, the examples that I, that I give, you know, diversity and inclusion is the right thing to do. Yeah. 
but there's value in that. And we so, so how do you, I mean, obviously, do you feel that boards around Australia have got this? Because uh, a lot of their major shareholders clearly don't think they have. And then on the other hand, you know, later in this conference, there'll be somebody saying on diversity that half the boards don't talk about that enough. There'll be somebody else saying, well, perhaps we need to think about, you know, boards having a, a digital board member, a real brain. Um, we need more conversation about that. I mean, what are we going to do? Just have longer board meetings, more board meetings? So how, how, how on earth do you cope on a board? Yeah, well, there's, there's two dimensions to that, which is, I think, you know, how do you make sure your board's fit for purpose? And, and the other dimension is, how do you really tackle these important ESG uh, issues with your key stakeholders and, and importantly, shareholders? I think the, the climate transition action plan that we took to our shareholders for a vote was a really good example of how we just decided to get off the back foot and get on the front foot and, and really engage. You know, in, all f in fairness to shareholders, you know, they're an inch, inch deep and a mile wide across a whole bunch of sectors. And, and the, you know, they don't necessarily run, understand your business, certainly not as well as, as you do or your management team does. And so we saw this as a really important opportunity to get our plan out there. Because it was going to a vote, you get their attention. And to spend, you know, Mike and I separately, but collectively did 40 shareholder engagement meetings. Mm -hmm. Some of those were, you know, uh, one-on-ones and some of those were uh, uh, group meetings. But we did 40 meetings into heading into the, uh, the vote in mm -hmm. order to explain our plans to shareholders. And we got to a level of understanding and clarity. And I, I gave the example around uh, steel manufacturing and the supply chain and the challenges around all of that. And we had those open, honest, in-depth discussions around that. So I, I think if it's, for us, climate's so important that it's, you know, we, we thought that we needed to just amp up the engagement with our shareholders at a level of detail that would allow us then to get a successful vote up get yep. confidence in our plan, and move on with actions. Okay. Well, a lot of climate questions coming through on my iPad, but before we go there, I just want to get a, a sense on a couple of other issues. Um, how business should see the, the, the crisis in Ukraine? I mean, we've, we've just seen BP, for example, drop that, that $14 billion stake in, in Rosneft. Now, that can't have been an easy decision. Yeah. Are we going to see more really big decisions like that ricochet through the world? I think we are. I think we are. I think there was another, there was a, a, a few more decisions that came up from large corporates who are stepping away from Russia today. Um, you know, I'll leave the geopolitics to the politicians, but as business people, um, you know, our role is to understand those situations, to understand the potential range of outcomes that can come from a geopolitical situation. And, you know, we call that scenario analysis. And then develop contingency plans around that to protect the business. That's, that's our job. But none of us have a great crystal ball, so we always use this scenario analysis uh, uh, process to do that. In I mean, our that's case, a pretty I mean, extreme scenario, isn't it? Yeah, well, look, everything from hopefully, you know, I always say, you know, hope for the best and plan for the worst. Um, so there's everything from one scenario, which would be, you know, quick resolution, peaceful resolution, which we're all hoping for, to the unthinkable. And, and we've just got to understand the implications to our business and get out in front, which is what, look, that's what everybody did during the pandemic, very successfully. You know, I'm sure all the board members around the table here thought through the implications of the pandemic to them, got in front of the issues, and... I but, but, but if we pull this down, say, to China, obviously, uh, I mean, Australia maintains this incredibly pragmatic relationship with China on, on iron ore exports, coal exports. Uh, I mean, how should we be, be viewing that relationship with China now? Who, China must be watching the Ukraine very, and this land grab very carefully. Um, has anything changed? Well, I, I put it in perspective, you know, Europe for us is less than 2%. I think it's a billion dollars of sales out of a $60 billion corporation. So, you know, it's, it's a small piece. China, different story. And it's a very important part of our business. So obviously we've done all the scenario analysis around the, the geopolitical implications there. That said, um, our relationships business to business with our Chinese suppliers and customers have never been stronger, have never been stronger. And that's not just my perception of, or our team's perception. You know, there's hard data around that. We just finished our latest net promoter score uh, exercise, and we've had the highest ratings um, from our Asian customers than we've ever had. 
you know, the value for the relationships, the value around the products, the value around the service, um, has, it has never been higher. And, um, and so that, you know, that gives us good confidence. Um, and, and look, I think... But do you explore there is other a, there markets? Is, in, in, there, in markets? In, I mean, in, in, this, in a massively downside extreme scenario, of is course. it possible for, for big mining in Australia to pivot? Yeah, well, if we just, you know, just to finish up on that, you know, there is this mutual dependency mm. between Australia and China. Um, so we've got these great relationships on the ground today. Yes, there's some friction government to government, but there is this mutual dependency. We need China, and China needs us. And, and so, you know, I have, I'm optimistic that we will work our way through these issues. And we won't agree on everything, and nor should we. But we'll be able to work our way through it and continue to have a strong trading relationship as, as, as we do today. That said, um, you know, there's... Um, bans on uh, coal exports from Australia in, into China. Um, and we've been able to divert our product into other markets. Uh, the great thing about uh, Australian uh, mineral resources business is, you know, they have very high quality products, very low cost, and, you know, if we can't service uh, the most profitable market for us, then we can divert the products into other markets. And we've always been able to place our, market, our products into other markets. Um, um, so, you know, there, there is other options, but, you know, again, there is this mutual dependency between, between uh, Australia and China. All right, here's an interesting one coming through from Jane L. Last year at the conference, a speaker said that a whisper at the lowest levels of a company becomes a roar at board level. What do you see as a roar in BHP? I'm not sure there's anything that I would call a roar. Um, and by the way, it's a, it's a very interesting um, observation. I think that's why it's so important for directors to get out and kick the tires of, of operations. And I think, if it, you know, I, I said before, I'm really proud of the business community, of global capitalism, and the way it's managed through all the ambiguity of the pandemic. You think about it, the results have been amazing mm. uh, in this great uncertainty and ambiguity. Um, and, but the one thing I have missed is, you know, all these 2D meetings that have been going on with screens and the ability to, the inability to sort of get out to the operations and, and, and to kick the tires and, and to engage with stakeholders, you know, whether that's customers or suppliers or coworkers or the community. I mean, that's a really important role of a director. I always say, you know, we need to make, just to make sure that the words and the music line up, that what we're hearing around the boardroom table aligns with what we're seeing um, in, in the field. Yeah. Uh, it's so, a really important part of it. Of so the a, a number of these ESG issues have uh, all over the place have started as a whisper and ended up as a roar. And of course, most recently, particularly on the mining side in Western Australia, the whole respect at work thing. Now, uh, Rio Tinto has clearly hit that head on now with its own internal corporate report. Uh, BHP clearly has similar issues. Will you be doing the same thing? Well, first and foremost, we acknowledge the outcomes of, of the Rio Tinto report. In 2018, so four years ago now, the Australian Workplace Survey came out and said that 70% of women in the resource sector had experienced some sort of harassment. In 2018, at board level, we just took that as truth and started to take action. And, you know, actually it goes back to 2016 when we put in place our gender uh, uh, balance target for 2025. I talked about that during the speech. We've gone from sort of 18% female participation in the workforce to, to uh, 30, over 30% 30 participation in the workforce. In 2018, again on the back of the Australian Workplace Survey, we identified sexual assault and sexual harassment as a safety risk, and we built it into our safety program. So now it gets exactly the same sort of data collection, rigor, follow-up and process that any safety issue would uh, within our company. We also launched a respectful behaviors program in 2018 that goes company-wide and gives leaders toolkits in order to identify um, you know, so, so how are you going to measure all this? I mean, obviously, the answer is, that I'm not getting a clear yes, you're going to do well, a I haven't public. finished my answer. Okay. <laughs> um, 
and we have a program in place today with a number of actions driven out of the, um, out of the uh, office of the CEO, so at the very highest level, working across sexual assault and sexual harassment issues. We're deploying $300 million of capital into our uh, work camps in order to make them safer for women. And all of this is tied back to executive progress, is tied back to, to executive remuneration and is reported against in the annual report. Yeah. So we're up clearly of the view, now is the time for action. We must eradicate this behavior. And I'm just not sure another report is going to be helpful at this point. We really need to focus on, a on action and eradication. Got it. Right. Well, a lot of um, support coming through to, to, to ask you more about climate change. So here we go. Um, how, does, how does the board manage the exit from carbon and short-term profits when confronted by transactions like Mandartha? Right. So good question. I mean, first and foremost, our exit from uh, our our energy coal assets, our lower value metallurgical coal assets, and petroleum aren't, aren't ESG pressure driven. They're, they're business driven. And we've done a lot of strategic planning scenario analysis. We look out decades in our strategic planning process. And because nobody's got a good crystal ball, we use scenario analysis. So we typically use three or four different scenarios with different sort of bookended outcomes. And as I said in the speech, there's no doubt decarbonization is going to happen. It's a question of pace. But in all scenarios, the more the world decarbonizes, the more valuable BHP becomes. And there are different commodities in our portfolio that be are more valuable. Um, and that's why we have this great focus on future-facing commodities, copper, nickel, yes, steel, including metallurgical coal and iron ore, uh, because it's needed to make this transition, um, you know, potash, these are all really important commodities as we look forward 10, 20, 30 years. Now, the reality is that energy coal and, and petroleum didn't perform as well in this scenario analysis. And when you look at the, the state of finance today, we now look at each of our commodities with a very specific cost of capital. And the cost of capital is going up across uh, fossil fuels. Yeah. So that, what that means is, is that you know, as you invest in them, you need to get better returns, and they become less competitive against the other alternatives that so we have in our portfolio. So we've got another question here from portfolio. Peter Bridgewater. Uh, to what extent does BHP see nature-based solutions crossing many ESG issues? It's in the mix, I guess, is the way that I would, the way would I, would, I would answer that. I mean, uh, biodiversity, for example, is another, we, I didn't talk about it in the speech, but it's another uh, key uh, area that we're focused on because it intersects with our business. Yeah, yeah, and things like um, carbon offsets, and can you see a, a big market developing down here? Yes, uh, look, first and foremost, we're very focused on operational reduction of emissions. That's gotta be the focus, and, but the reality is there are hard to abate emissions. You know, there are fugitive emissions from some of our mining operations, for example. Steel, there are huge challenges in steel. So there may be some areas. We, we, have, a, we have a goal, we have an ambition of, of net zero by 2050. Um, and we're of the view that to get there, given what we know today, um, that offsets will have to play some part of that. But we want to try to minimize the use of offsets. And then I think it's really critical that we're, that we're clear around quality of offsets, and I think there's got to be a lot of focus put around quality of offsets, and, I, and, and we're of the view we want to control and manage and be responsible for the offsets as much as, as, much as possible Ken, for that exact reason. Uh, I'm sure there are people out there for whom this is happening right now, but if you were approached to chair a publicly listed board, uh, what are the sort of things that you should be asking yourself before you say yes? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, look, I guess everyone's different and every company si situation is different. Um, I guess the, the one piece of advice I would give is to take a step back, honestly assess where the company is, what the challenges it has going forward, what's going to be required from the chair, and then to take a look at your own experience, skill set, resilience, um, and, and honestly assess if, if you're the right person, you know, if you're fit for purpose for the role. Um, and I think we all get a little blinded by ambition every once in a while, and, and I think you have to put that aside and say, because at the end of the day, you want to be successful, and you want to be fit for purpose, and I think just doing that honest assessment um, 
making sure that um, you understand the challenges and that you've got the skill set to, um, to do the job. And presumably, you take a pretty good look at the CEO. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, there's a whole bunch of due diligence you should do before you take the job. Um, and uh, look, I think all directors would recognize picking the CEO is the most important job that um, You've done a, quite a, a bit of work have. on that front. I have. Yeah, I, I I wrote about that actually in the in the, in the company director ma magazine. I mean, I'm a I'm a, a firm believer. It, it's to be honest, you know, in the vernacular, if you get the right CEO, everything's sweet. You know, uh, if you get the wrong CEO, it's not. Um, so, and and look, boards have to be realistic about the impact that they can have. We're part timers. The CEO's not. Uh, we create, we set the tone, but the the CEO and the management team provide the leverage. Yeah. They're in the business every day. They're providing the role modeling, you know, behaviors. Um, and so choosing the right CEO is critical. And, and you know, it, it's not rocket science, but it requires diligence, you know. And, and you know, I advocate that, advocate that you, you need to understand where the business is going. You need to understand the skill sets required out of the CEO. You then need to look inside the organization for potential successors. You need to map those successors against that profile, identify gaps, and then your job, working with the CEO, is to close the gap of all the internal potential successors mm. um, to get them ready for the job. And you know that's a multi-year journey. You know it's not something, and I think some boards leave it too late. Yeah. You know. I, the time to start CEO succession, as we're doing at PHP, is the day you appoint the new CEO. Yeah. You should have, you should be thinking about the next one. And then underpinning all that, obviously, is, is the whole, um, the, 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 the importance of culture right throughout the organization. So we've got another very popular question here from Nikki Bowman. In an organization of the scale of BHP, I mean, you are the biggest company in Australia now, daylight behind you. How does the board assess whether the culture on the ground is reflective of the objectives set by the board, particularly in relation to ESG. Yeah, so we uh, across multiple dimensions. But again, your best defense is getting the right CEO and the right in the right uh, getting the right, right CEO with the right values, and who clearly understands the expectations of of the board in terms of uh, uh, behavior. So that's that's absolutely should be should be job one. And then you know, as as directors, we sort of set tone. Uh, our job is to help make management in the company successful. We've got a number of risk management practices, but we need to verify. We always need to verify. You need to make sure that the words and the music line up around the boardroom table. Um, and so, you know, having those opportunities, whether it be through employee perception surveys, whether it's when you're out in the field meeting with, with uh, you know, coworkers directly, um, you know, it extends beyond the organization, you know, talking to communities, talking to suppliers, talking to customers, all of this should give you a good sense of of culture and creating an environment, part of this tone setting is creating an environment where it's safe to speak up and making sure that you've got the mechanisms that allow those, as somebody said earlier, these voices to, to come up, you know, whether it, you know, whistleblower processes that typically run through the risk and audit committee and give visibility to the board. And, this and, sort of and the voices at board level. So as a chairman, uh, what would you like to hear uh, m more of and what would you like to hear less of uh, from independent directors? Well, the day, it's interesting, you know, they get that question a lot. I think the days of uh, being a non-executive director as being a nice way to transition from executive life to full-time retirement are gone. Everybody's laughing. They know that's true. They're gone. It's a real job. Um, and and well, Because sometimes and, outside, we in the media, we're quite cynical about that. No, so. it's a real job, um, and, and it's getting harder. It's not getting easier, and I think, uh, again, my advice to boards is look forward to the challenges that, that you see on the runway in front of you, and constantly, just like CEO succession, constantly keep your skills matrix under review, mm. and constantly and honestly assess your board against the skills matrix. So back, you know, it be three or four years ago, we didn't have technology uh, on our skills matrix on, on the board of BHP. Uh, it'd be five, six years ago and, uh, that we identified that. Um, and we've, you know, given, there's both risk and opportunity in technology, right? So there's, 
cyber risk, obviously, uh, in our mind sites, we're becoming more automated, we're becoming more ten, uh, uh, dependent on technology, and therefore the risks are going up. But there's also opportunity uh, through technology as well. So we've brought on board actually two directors who have technology backgrounds. But I think you also have to be careful that you don't get sort of siloed directors. So our directors have a very broad experience base. One was a CEO of a technology, a very successful CEO of a technology company. Uh, the other has been a chief technology officer, but a number of different sectors. Um, because you want to make sure that all your directors sort of have the overarching acumen to sit on the board and then bring, if they, you know, you need to make sure that you're able to complement and fill out your entire skills matrix. So they need to also bring uh, specific skills. And we've seen this incredible amount of M&A activity out there across Australia, both, both in terms of companies going out and, and acquiring, but also, I mean, some companies even taken off the, the boards altogether. So, you know, there's a board, you're looking at defense. Now, uh, how does that change how a board operates, how a board think, given that, you know, we often hear this statistic banded around 75% of takeovers don't actually work, yeah. you know, uh, how, how does that um, focus the mind, I suppose? Well, I guess, um, look, we'd all agree that a growing company is a healthy company, and, and so we're all uh, pursuing growth, but it's got, it can't be growth for growth's sake, it's got to be growth for shareholder returns. And so, you know, we're, we're actively pursuing a, a future-facing commodity growth strategy at BHP, and we've got a number of levers that we're pulling. We've got exploration. We've got uh, early entry, where we make investments in startups. We've, we're, we're doing brownfield expansions that are existing. We're doing greenfield expansions, like the potash uh, project that we're doing in Janssen. And oh, yes, we have M&A as an opportunity as well. So these are all levers that we, that we have at our disposal, and they're all important. I think the challenge in the current environment is asset values are really high. So the starting point, you know, you've got to bring something unique and special to a, an acquisition in order to make the math work and get returns for shareholders. So that's sort of on the growth side. I think you also alluded to the defense side. Uh, my answer to that is simple. The best way to defend yourself from, you know, predatory M&A activity is to perform. Uh, you know, if you're performing, then you're going to be expensive, and if you're expensive, then it's hard to make the math work. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can defend yourself more readily. Mm -hmm. If you start to underperform, then you open yourself up to. So what is occupying Ken McKenzie's mind mostly now? I mean, obviously, you've successfully done the, the dual listing. You and uh, um, Mike Henry have had lots of close conversations with some of your major shareholders also over the other side of the world, all done in the, in the pandemic. But, but what's occupying your, your time now? Is it the bullying and harassment stuff? I mean, that's, that must be certainly a lot of focus from, from the media. Yeah, so, you know, first of all, going to the positive side of the, the agenda, you know, there, there's no doubt that we're focused on, we've done a lot of work, as you mentioned, to reposition our portfolio. We're, we're very happy with the way that that's uh, unfolded. I think you know, everyone's familiar with the Woodside transaction. I mean, we. Again, we didn't exit petroleum for ESG reasons. We exited because we didn't see it competing for capital against our other options in the portfolio. But we had arguably a subscale petroleum business. Woodside arguably had a subscale petroleum business. There will be challenges in the energy transition. These two businesses together are a top 10 independent oil company with a strong balance sheet. But you're doubling down on and, fossil, really. And a, and, a, and a plethora of options, and we're spinning that out to our shareholders. So we're going to, you know, BHP shareholders will own 48% of the combined entity, and they can make their own decisions on whether they want to continue to par participate in that, in, that sector, in that sector or not. Um, so we've done a lot of work around the portfolio. We're very happy with where the, where the portfolio sits um, today. And, our, and as I mentioned, we've got these five levers that we're actively pursuing around growth. So that's the core agenda. We, we, you know, obviously, uh, capability, safety, capability, and culture are always front of mind for us. You know, I've already talked in, in depth around the sort of activities that we've got on that in, in, in place. Mm -hmm. Again, it's for management to execute on and, for the, and the board to monitor and challenge yep. the progress against those activities. And then again, there's so much complexity in, in what's called ESG. There's so much complexity there. Boards just have to find a way to cut through the complexity and focus on the issues that matter. And the, again, repeating myself, and this was the, hopefully the central theme of the speech. Yeah, it wasn't get, about yeah. ESG. It was about how to make ESG yeah. an opportunity in business. But um, is the intersection of your business with ESG issues. Focus where the intersection is strongest. Right. One last quick one. Uh, just back on Ukraine um, from Jennifer Wilson. BHP's actions uh, are admirable. 
But given the importance of China to the company, how likely is something similar to this? Should China move aggressively against Taiwan? Well, I'm not going to respond to hypotheticals. I, you know, I think in the case of Ukraine and Russia, we, literally, we don't have any supply to or from either of those countries. So we're, we're literally uh, you know, on, on, on the sidelines there from a business perspective. Um, you know, I'm an optimist. That ticky. I, I think the reality is there is this mutual dependency between um, China and Australia. We need them, they need us. The relationship, although strained at the, at the senior political level, is super strong at the grassroots level in terms of our uh, business, and, business and trading relationships. And I'm optimistic. We won't agree on everything, uh, but I'm optimistic that um, because of this mutual dependency, we'll work our way through to, to, to a, a good outcome. Ken McKenzie, you are the big Australian once more, quite literally. Uh, thank you so much for your spe speech, and thank you especially for uh, sharing the time with me and our audience. Ken McKenzie, ladies and gentlemen.